appreciate you guys coming out. We hope you guys are as excited as we are for the re release of the throttle. It's been a long time coming, 20 years. Well, 21 now, I guess, huh? Uh, so yeah, we are handing out a little uh, pamphlet here that gives you some information about LCC and the throttle, and I believe also the command station that we're also developing. Uh, just a little precursor on LCC, if you guys aren't familiar with it, it stands for Layout Command Control instead of Digital Command Control. And it's a new communication method up and coming in the industry that we can use to control uh, trackside devices and other things like that. Uh, and it also allows us to communicate with our throttle to our command station and those trackside devices, as well as locomotives and everything else on DCC. So you can think of it as a completely separate ecosystem that's also integrated into your existing DCC. So it's basically transparent. So yeah, today we're gonna to be talking about our throttle. UWT-100 stands for Universal Wi-Fi Throttle. So, there's plenty of throttles out on the market now these days. What makes ours different than everybody else's? Why should you buy our product? Well, first thing is that we use Wi-Fi on our throttle versus any sort of proprietary radio systems. Wi-Fi is obviously something that is a recognized and robust standard. We have a total of eight remappable keys on the throttle, which you can program to be whatever it is that you'd like them to be. So your most common operations obviously might differ than everybody else's. And so whatever you want to have at your fingertips at all times, you have up to eight options that you can choose from. We put a big emphasis into ergonomics on this one. You might find compared to some of, or most of, the other throttles on the market these days, they're not particularly comfortable. Whereas our throttle was specifically designed to be comfortable, ambidextrous, and a good weight, while giving you still all the features, and uh, it's not gonna strain your hand, you're not gonna hurt your fingers on the buttons, stuff like that. Uh, the other thing is that the <coughs> emphasis we put into the keypad on there gives you a very solid tactile response. Uh, the way that you push the button, it's satisfying, and you can tell for sure I pushed that button there's no guesswork of, well, I pushed it, did it work? It definitely worked. Uh, this throttle is universal and portable, which means that you can use it with other systems. You can use it at your home. You can use it at your friend's house. You can use it at your club or anywhere else that you go. You can control trains. And the screen is obviously much larger than you'll find on a majority of throttles out there. Well, it allows us to display a lot of information in a way that's easy to read and easy to understand. And we offer a bunch of customization options as well within the product. So things like the brightness of the screen, um, all the buttons and stuff like that. There's a couple other things. We'll get to that later. So why? Why Wi-Fi? Why should I use Wi-Fi? And a, per a question that I commonly get asked when we talk about Wi-Fi is, let's say I'm a Digitrax user or an NCE user and I use uh, their radio system. Will our throttle work with my existing radio system? Yes, but no. The systems can work in parallel with one another, but we're not directly communicating with your existing radio network. What we're using is Wi-Fi, and so you can run your Wi-Fi to a computer, you could run your Wi-Fi to uh, a direct connection device like the LNWIs, and that will communicate in parallel with your existing systems. There's not gonna be any interference you're not going to have to expand that radio system if you already have one, and you don't have to take it out either. So what makes Wi-Fi better than everything else? Well, you have expanded range over a lot of the radio systems that are out there right now. They're using specific bands and stuff like that, which don't offer a lot of permeation through walls. They don't give you a very wide range that you can walk before you have to get yourself a booster uh, or another uh, receiver. You also have greater reliability for that same reason. You're not going to have intermittent spots when you're walking around where you're going to drop the signal as often. It's a robust standard that's recognized by industries that are not just trains, which means that there's a whole army of people working on Wi-Fi, and it's something that you can rely on. The other thing it allows you to do potentially in the future is remote access. I know a guy that uh, runs trains abroad, and he likes to have operators from all around the world watch his layout run. Well, he has cameras in his locomotives. So now what if I had a throttle and I wanted to communicate and run his trains on his layout and I could see through his cameras? You might be able to do that because Wi-Fi 
and the internet, you can connect to everybody and everywhere at any time. As I said, we don't use a proprietary communication standard, which means it's more universal. Uh, you're going to find Wi-Fi's everywhere. You walk anywhere in this hotel, there's Wi-Fi. You walk anywhere down the street, there's Wi-Fi. So it's all over the place. It's at the show. It means that you don't necessarily need to bring some sort of special system along with you in order to be able to run your throttle. Yeah, and like I said, we can run potentially trains through the internet. So you don't even have to have your throttle and your train in the same place. It's pretty cool. Oh, funny story about that before we continue. When we were in the development process, one of our developers in the shop, one of our engineers, was using a throttle and he was trying to use it with our, our test layout. And he's like, why isn't my train working? And then we get a call from our, one of our other engineers in Zurich and he says, hey, stop running my train. <laughs> so we figured that out. But that's a, that's a funny story I like to share. All right, good. So this is a good transition right here. Our friend here just found the flashlight which is mounted on the top of the unit. We have two LEDs on the top, and those serve as a flashlight. If you go into the main menu, which you can access using the, bar, the button that has three bars on your throttle, and you scroll through the options, you'll see one that says flashlight, and you can actually activate that. So if you drop anything weird under your layout, some small parts, you can't see it, fire yep. up your flashlight, you always have one on hand. It's also helpful for decoupling and stuff like that. Uh, and the flashlight is also something that you can map to one of the eight buttons that I had mentioned before. So if you uh, would rather have it more accessible than it already is, you can put it on a single button. If we take a look at the main screen here, the biggest thing you're going to see there is the locomotive address. It's displayed prominently and proudly right in the top left of your screen. Below that you have a direction indicator and the current speed step that your locomotive is traveling. If it's not traveling, you'll see a big zero there. Any other thing, you'll be able to track your speed steps right there. On the other side of the screen, we have a battery indicator, which is kind of a nice heads up feature because some throttles just don't show you where the battery status is and you could be caught dead in the middle of an operating session. This is gonna give you fair warning when you see that thing crawling down that it's time to change your batteries. And the Wi-Fi signal strength is also displayed right next to that. So if you're getting a little bit far away from your router, you keep tabs on that and make sure that your network is solid. Something that's not shown here that you might see on your throttle is a small, a few letters underneath the Wi-Fi indicator there. There's a, two connection protocols that you can use. You can connect through the Y-throttle protocol that you might use the same way that you use a cell phone or LCC if you have an LCC command station. So you'll see a little WT if you're on Y-throttle or LCC if you're connected through those protocols. And you can switch and change those pretty conveniently right from within your throttle. Below that, you'll see the programmable function keys. There are four buttons on the bottom. They have little dots on them, one, two, three, and four and you can assign different functions to those things. It could be your horn, bell, headlight, like are displayed here. It can be other less common functions that you don't want to have to scroll through function pages to get. You can go to our menu and assign them to one of those four buttons on the top. And the coolest thing about this is they have on-screen displayed. So as long as your functions are named in your decoder, if you pull up F3 like here, that's just, you've assigned that function three. Whatever is assigned to function three is gonna happen when you press this button. But over here, if they're named, these have assignments like a bell or a horn. And this one here is set up to be a quick recall. So the last one you have access, which was locomotive 1999, and then you have an active address of 2019. You can swap those real quickly by just pressing the recall button right there. It operates a lot like the NCE recall system, except uh, only between two locomotives. Uh, we have a different system for recalling between several different locomotives. Um, something else before we continue on to the next section is you guys can play around with these throttles to your heart's content. You can select locomotives, you can do accessory stuff, you're not going to mess anything up because we're not actually running anything. So you'll notice that if you pick them up and you hadn't selected a locomotive yet, it just has an E there in the top, like right here. It just means empty, it means you don't have a locomotive selected. Uh, if you press the select loco button, it'll bring up my roster that's on this laptop right here. And uh, you can also type in addresses manually, so you can, uh, you can do stuff like that. If you then call up the locomotive, one of the locomotives from the roster, they'll all have their functions assigned in JMRI, so you can see function map. So like for example, if this was F3 or something else, it would tell you what it is. So then moving on here. So in the middle of the throttle, we have some different ways of controlling the speed steps of your train. So you have two options here. You can use the drive arrows, 
which are programmable, or the scroll wheel in the middle. Now, the thumb wheel, you can scroll up and down. That's going to give you your speed steps one at a time, one, two, three, and on and on and on. You can program these chevron buttons to increase or decrease your speed steps at certain increments. So if you wanted to just do five speed steps at a time, up, 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 you could program it to be that, five, 10, 20, whatever you'd like to use for small and large increments. The other cool thing about these buttons, they are also programmable in the same way that these four are. So you don't need to use these for speed steps. You could also use these for functions. You could use them for perhaps the TCS braking feature, which can progressively break your locomotive <coughs> percentages of 20. Um, whatever functions you'd like to set up, those, those are also programmable there. Yeah. So for example, like what I like to do is on my diesels, I'll set these up to be my uh, manual notching buttons. So manual notch up, manual notch down. And I'll set these to be the brake release and brake application. It's just nice and handy, so I don't have to go hunt for the buttons. Mm -hmm. Especially since manual notching is on button 10 and button 11. I don't want to have to page through my functions to find it. They're right there. And then right below those buttons, you'll see the main menu, which is on your left, the switch direction button in the middle, and then the function shift button here. This has several different things. If you're entering text, for example, like a Wi-Fi password, this can just right away change the case of that text, just like a normal shift would on a keyboard. And obviously you have your standard 0 through 9 function buttons. Uh, there's also the select locomotive button we talked about. We have accessory mode control for both uh, DCC accessories and LCC accessories depending upon what mode you're connected to. And uh, you have an e-stop function here. We'll talk a little bit more about how that works a little bit later. And then up here you'll see this little button with a question mark. That is our help button. If you push this button uh, it will give you help or whatever it is that you're looking at. So on the drive window, we call that function help, and it'll display all of the functions of your locomotive as read out from your roster, uh, if you have one. Or in the menus, if you push that button, it will tell you what that menu option does, and that is for all of the menus uh, in the throne. And then obviously on the back side, you have battery compartment, it takes two AA batteries. So we talked a little bit about ergonomics. Let's talk a little bit more. Uh, we ask you, the throttle that you're using today to control your trains, is it comfortable for you? Is it something that you can hold in your hand for hours and hours and hours and it doesn't cause you any stress or it's inconvenient or abrasive uh, or something you just want to set down after a period of time? Like I said, we'd spent a lot of time designing the case for this and the ergonomics and the way that it feels, the way that it's balanced, and the way that the buttons feel so that it's not strenuous on you after long periods of time. Um, I can attest to this myself that on the function buttons specifically, we spent hours and hours and hours and hours and hours talking about what each one of the buttons should be printed with, and angles of all the different uh, the buttons and stuff like that. We redesigned the turnout for the accessory like five times. So we took a lot of time to scrutinize this ourselves so that it makes sense and that is comfortable for it. Is this the final case? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Yep, these are our final cases. We just got these uh, injection molded, and uh, they don't have the printing on it, all that. Uh, these are, uh, when they're finished, they're going to have our logo and stuff printed on them. But other than that, the same, um, has a little bit of a glossy feel to it. A, a yeah, there's a little bit of a texture a to it. Yep. And that's, and that's, that is the way it's going to be. That right? is the way that it's going to be, yes. Right. Yep. Uh, the other thing is that unlike a lot of other throttles out there for the thumb wheel we have a recess in it you may have noticed and so when you're scrolling with it you don't hit the sides of your thumb on the side of the case any sharp edges or anything like that it's nice and smooth. It also gives you more range so that you come down into the top and the bottom of the recess so you can spin it further. Um, so yeah that's another thing. Uh, and like I said before it's ambidextrous. I'm left-handed. I can use it evenly or equally as well as anybody who's right-handed can. So I'll talk a little bit about how to connect it. Um, if you're talking about, let's say I have a Digitrack system. Digitrax offers this, uh, the LocoNet wireless interface, I believe it stands for, or LNWI. These just plug right into the cab bus for your command station. And our throttle connects over Wi-Fi to this. It's really quick. They don't have a password. So you just look for it. You say, OK, there it is, connected, and you're done. That's it. And you're already connected and able to run your trains. Um, the other method that is available is through a PR3 or PR4 that Digitrax offers. 
And those would then communicate with a computer, which you could be running JMRI on. You might use that for your programming track or whatever to make your programming more easy. A lot of people do that. And then your computer, whatever you're running it on, would then communicate with either your home Wi-Fi or your uh, club Wi-Fi. And then our throttle would communicate or connect to that Wi-Fi. So then it goes to the throttle, to the router, to the computer, through the PR4, to the command station. A little bit longer of a track, but you don't really notice that uh, as far as the connection goes. But what this connection method allows you to do in this example for the uh, Digitrack system is it unlocks a lot more of the features of the throttle. Uh, with the LNWI, you lose out on functions uh, like uh, in the function help or the function remapping. The, the LNWI can't report what that function is to the throttle because it doesn't know any better. Whereas if you have a JMRI system that's running uh, a roster entry, that roster entry would have all of the function information and, and all that sort of stuff. So you could give your locomotive a name, you could give your locomotive a different function map, and the throttle would be able to know that because of this, but not with the LNWIs. LNWIs are basically you just run your trains. But it's a little bit easier to connect. The same sort of situation applies to the NCE. That's what we're running right here right now. Um, and this is obviously communicating with a little router that I have on the floor that talks to the laptop. The laptop then connects through NCE's USB interface to the power cab, and then I can run my trains uh, and any sort of accessories. So same sort of situation. Does anybody have any questions about that so far before I move on? Yes? Um, I have a Wi-Fi throttle from ESU, and I have their command station, and that works. Would this work with that command station? Is it the cab control system? Is it a what? The cab control system from ESU? Yes. Okay. So that system doesn't support communication with the Y throttle protocol. It uses their own uh, communication method. Since this one is communicating to these systems is using the Wi Follow protocol, it doesn't talk directly to it. Okay. But that system can also be connected to a computer that runs JMRI, which again would unlock all of those features we talked about. And uh, but no, it's not a direct so connection. You have a command station coming out. That's right. That would solve that problem. Yes. When do you think that's coming out? So the team is going to be joining us over the next couple of weeks to uh, speed up the process a little okay. bit for that. Um, the command station is a little bit early in its development. It's functional. It's at our booth. If you stop by the show, you want to check it out, it's running. Um, I'd expect that we're going to be winding up getting that out maybe a year or two from now. We're less. Honestly, we're less, a lot more yeah. of the development has gone on. So it's kind of up in the air, but I'm feeling pretty optimistic that it could be out by the end of 2020. So. Constructions, do you have a help? <laughs> so a place that's on the web I can go that would tell me what to do. Yes. Um, the, the cool thing about it is, and you got, none of you guys got to see this because I did it, but the throttle has a connection setup process. It has a tutorial when you first turn it on. So it tells you a little bit about how to use the throttle, and then it automatically allows you to connect with stuff. So the intricacies of the particular command stations, it doesn't cover that, but it will help you get connected directly to a Wi-Fi and directly to whatever system it is that you're running very easily and automatically. Uh, but there are obviously examples like that with the cab control system that I know for a fact doesn't directly communicate. But for example, if we go back here to the LNWI, this would just be you turn the throttle on, you go through the little setup process, you say, oh, here's my LNWI. Would you like to add it? Yes. Boom. Done. That's it. All right. So some of the key features of the throttle. Uh, it boots up very quick. Uh, we can get connected to a previous network that was already established in under five seconds. Um, it's usually like two. Uh, it just depends how fast you can turn it on. Uh, we also have an adjustable backlight setting, as I mentioned earlier. So if, you're, uh, if you want to have it on bright all the time instead of it going dim, you can do that. If you want to change how bright it is, if it's too bright for you, you can turn it down or turn it up. Um, and there's also a timeout for it for the menu and for the drive window, so you can have those separate. Uh, the shift function, as Stephen was mentioning earlier, is persistent. So if you push the shift button when you're going through the functions, uh, it will stay on that page. So for example, if you are familiar with the NCE system, if you push the option button or shift zero to go to the next page, you push a button and it kicks you right back to the beginning again. Whereas with this, you are going to stay on that page until you page back out. So if you have a function that you need to use repeatedly in the higher numbers above nine, makes it a lot more convenient to do that. Uh, 
configurable auto shutdown. The thing will automatically turn off after 15 minutes on its own. You can change that to either never turn off or turn off sooner if you want to save your battery life. Um, and it can connect to almost any DCC system that's out there right now. So the cab control system being an example of one that you can't directly connect to, but through JMRI you can connect to basically every system that's out there on the market. Um, and so since we can talk to JMRI, JMRI can talk to that system. It opens you up to just about everything. And you can have multiple connections and you can manage them and they'll try to automatically connect on their own. So for example, if I have my throttle at my house, which I do, and then I have my throttle at work, which I also do, and if I have a club that I go to, I can have different connections for all of those and they'll all be stored in the throttle and they will connect automatically whenever I go there because they'll know the, uh, they'll be familiar with that Wi-Fi and they'll be familiar with the systems. And so if I power it on in that particular place, it'll just go, okay, here I am, this is where I am, this is what I need to do, and it's done. You can also add multiple connections. I think our maximum number of connections is nine. So you can have nine different Wi-Fi's stored in there, and you can swap back between them at any time. Um, and I said that use two AA batteries. We can use just about every chemistry AA battery that's out there. That's lithium, alkaline, NICAD, uh, just about anything. Pretty much you can put anything yeah. in there. It's not going to explode on you. Right. Just the key thing here. Uh, re rechargeable so feature. Right if you have the rechargeable type batteries, does that have a... Uh, it doesn't have a charger. Itself, that, it doesn't have a charger within itself, but you can use rechargeable batteries with it. Because yeah. I know you said NICAD and all that. But right. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. it's like that. Yeah, we don't have any sort of like USB or anything like that or a wireless charger that you can charge on while they're in. Yes? How long is the lifetime without one battery? So it depends on the brand, obviously, but we've seen battery lives better than 20 hours of continuous use. Uh, the power will automatically turn itself off, and there is no off switch. The trickle current on the batteries uh, when it is powered off is less than 5 microamps. So it's an incredibly, incredibly low trickle current, which is actually less than the self-discharge rate of the batteries themselves, if you're talking about rechargeables. So the throttle is not going to discharge your batteries. I know that that was a thing with uh, the Digitrax, the, the early versions of the Digitrax wireless throttles, where you put a 9-volt in there, and the next day it'd be dead. Um, yeah, the, old, the new ones do the same thing. Do they still? Okay. No, you don't have to worry about that with this. Yeah, you can lay it on your shelf for six months, pick yeah. it back up, and it's going to activate pretty much at the same battery level as that. Yeah, I think uh, one of us calculated it out to be like three years before it would discharge a battery completely to the point where it wouldn't be usable. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll talk about some of the functions here. Uh, well, there weren't any other questions, were there? Yes? Yeah, just point of clarification, you can manually turn Yes. Yeah. If I didn't make that clear, I apologize. You can manually turn the throttle off instead of using the automatic shutoff feature. If you go into the menu and then push button number nine or scroll down and select option nine, that's the power off. So you can turn it off whenever you want. Anything else? Any other questions so far? Yes. I see, I see a lot of companies. Uh, advertising that the internet is all slowed down and you got my boosters and stuff in your internet. Will this have anything to do with that? Will this, should a person have a booster on their internet connection in order to use something like this? Or is it, no. does it draw any more than anything else? No, this would be a lot less traffic traveling on this throttle than like a laptop or something like that. So or you, even a modern day cell phone. Like yeah. If you have a smartphone, that's going to be eating up a lot more of your Wi-Fi than something like this will. Right. So people say the average household with the router that you get from Comcast or whatever, right. you're going to have like 9 or 10, 12 connected devices before you really see things slowing down. This is almost not, you could have four or five of these throttles maybe before you start to see things interrupting your normal day to day. Right. And that's if you're using your home network. A lot of people have a dedicated layout network and then that becomes less of an issue as well. Yeah. It's going to depend a lot on the router that you use because there's different tiers. Each one has their own different capabilities. But your typical home router, like if you're running in this layout at your home and you just want to use your home Wi-Fi and you have like a dozen <coughs> of these throttles, it shouldn't be a problem. Now if you're the kind of person who has like a uh, hundred Wi-Fi LED bulbs in your house and you have uh, 
20 kids and they each have a smartphone or something like that, then you might have a problem. But your, your typical, typical user, typical use case, you're not going to have any problems at all by adding these to your network. So uh, some of the features that are available. Um, the quick recall function, which is the one dot button on the throttle by default. That'll quickly sw swap you back and forth between your two most recently selected addresses. Uh, so you could call up a new locomotive and it would then kick out the one that's already there and replace it with the one that you were previously using and you can just toggle back and forth. Uh, we're offering in-throttle consisting, which is a, which I believe a new consisting method. We'll cover that a little bit more in depth later. We talked about the eight customizable soft keys. You have the factory reset option available from the settings menu in case something goes terribly wrong. Uh, you're welcome to do that. Uh, that'll also clear out all of your networks that you've saved if you need to do that for some reason. Uh, the recall list on the throttle is theoretically infinite. So if you, uh, let's say for example, you're going back and forth between your home and your club. And you have your locomotives from your home that you bring to your club. If you're running at your house and you select those locomotives, they go into the recall list. When you take your throttle and you then connect to your uh, club network, those locomotives come with you and they're available in your recall stack so you can call them up. Uh, and you can delete things from the recall list if you don't use them, but uh, theoretically you can fill out that list with as many locomotives as you want. The question I have, the, the recall list, does that maintain all the, the function naming that you've got from your roster at home? No. Uh, that will only come from whatever system it's connected to. So that's, it's active. Right. Active. Every time the throttle powers on and connects, it'll pull your roster from whatever it is that it's connected to. So if in that situation, you'd need to have a copy of your roster entry wherever it is if you're going. Yes. How big a roster can you have? That's also theoretically infinite as well. Uh, we were working with a club in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. They have a really huge roster list for both turnouts, signals, and locomotives. I think they had over 300 locomotives in their list, and I could pull up their roster and scroll through the whole thing. And I think they had something like, what is it, 600, 600 accessories? It might have been more than that. I think it was yeah. more than that. I think it was, I think it was close to 1,000 signals and turnouts that they had on their layout, and we could go through that whole list too and use both of them simultaneously, both the locomotive list and the turnout list. So what if you're jumping back and forth between the turnout and controlling your engine? How, how is that implemented on the throttle? On the throttle, we have the accessory control button, which is the little turnout key. Uh, if you guys push that, you'll see that it pops up a list, and that list is actually one that they provided to us, and that has all of their signal, or not their signal, has all their turnouts on it. Uh, you can then type in a number, and it'll filter down by however many have that number. You can then toggle that accessory. And if you want to go back to selecting a locomotive, you can either select the locomotive or just escape out and it'll bring you back to the drive window where you can have your train. And you escape out by doing what? There is an escape button. Okay. So you just push that button or you can push the accessory button again and it'll, it'll also kick you back out. One button push and now you're One back. button push and you're back. You're back to the engine. Yes. Okay. That's good. good. All right. So then the other thing that we have I mentioned was the multi-stage e-stop function. Did we cover that later? I uh, don't. I think that we killed that slide. So let me tell you a little bit about how this works. Uh, on the e-stop, we have up to three different stages of e-stop. These stages can be locked out by the user or the operator of the throttle, but the first tier of the e-stop stops your particular locomotive, whatever it is you have selected on your drive window. Uh, the second tier stops all of the locomotives on the layout. And the third stage will then power off your layout. Uh, like I said, you can turn those features on and off. And so if you're like a, if you're a club and you have a couple of these things and you don't want to have your operators uh, killing your layout power by accident, you can turn that feature off. So like, uh, for example, some of the NCE clubs that I'm familiar with, if they don't know how to set those themselves, they can have somebody e-stop and power off their whole layout and then they got to go find the person who turned it off. With this, anybody can clear that as well. Anybody can clear a power off situation, as long as they have one of these. The basic idea is that there's a timer. So if you press the button once, and you press it a second time before the two or three second timer clears, it triggers the second stage. And then the timer will start again. If you press it within that timer, it'll activate the third stage. If you wait till that timer clears, 
then you can just clear that use stop. So anybody who has a throttle on right now should see that I just turned the power off. Uh, and any one of you should be able to push the e-stop button and clear that out. And I'll turn the power back on. I'll turn the power back on. But does that have to come from the person who issued the e-stop? No, because I turned the e-stop on. He turned it off. Yes, I did. <laughs> I, did. <laughs> I, did. Yes, I did. I did. I did. I did. I did. I played over e stops. <laughs> yeah, I designed, but that's a great thing. That, good, I designed the e stop features because yep. at my club we have NCE and somebody will put e stop and the whole layout goes down. And I got to run around saying, all right, who fumble fingered the e stop? Who did it? You know, we have an open house and the whole thing shuts down for 10 minutes while you figure out who accidentally pushed it. And they don't know who did it. Yeah. So I put that feature in exactly so that does not happen. So now with the TCS throttle, we fixed that problem. Yeah, there's, there's ways around that now, and it makes it a lot uh, easier to clear it out. I believe that it also should work if your NCE system shuts the power off, you can turn it back on, I think. All right, So along those lines, we can keep the throttle synchronized 100% of the time in real time. If two of you call up the same locomotive, you can see what the other one is doing, and you can interact with it. Hmm. So in other words, you can mess each other up. So you can, yeah. But we're both controlling the locomotive. That's right. Can you stop that? I mean, would you want to, to not have not that feature sometimes? Currently, uh, there is no way to be able to lock that sort of thing out. With the exception of on Digitrax. If on if you're connected on Digitrax, it'll ask you if you want to steal the address, because Digitrax has steel. Uh, <laughs> but like on an NCE system, no. So if somebody steals your locomotive, it'll tell you. If you want to, if you call something up that somebody else already has, it'll ask you if you want to steal it, and then you can yes no. All right. So going back to the operating functions here, um, we do have ten buttons, zero through nine. We talked about the shift key. Uh, one other thing is, if you push the function button, it tells you what it did. If you have a roster entry and you push a button, it'll pop up on the screen and tell you what you just turned on or turned off. Uh, and it'll tell you that for as long as you hold the button down, I believe, with a, be. a short little timer afterwards that it'll display as well. Yeah. Uh, we talked about the shift key and how it's persistent. When you press the shift key, you'll see that a little number here pops up in the corner. That would be for function page 0, so there's nothing. Function page 1, which would be 10 through 19, and function page 2, which is 20 through 27. Um, if you push the question mark button, that's the function help. On the function help, if you guys pull up a locomotive on the throttle and then push the question mark button on the drive screen, you should see everything that that locomotive is able to do. Uh, and then that obviously relies on having a roster entry. As you mentioned, it won't come with you. It is based on the system that it is connected to. An LNWI or an MRC Wi-Fi module will not show you. Yes. What's the difference between something highlighted and not highlighted? Highlighted means that it's on, not highlighted means that it's off. If you uh, go into the menu as well, there is a list version of the functions as well if you find that to be more convenient than the pages. It'll also have the names written out as well. Uh, yes, so we spent a lot of time with the UI. I've been working with the team a lot on the UI to make sure that everything makes sense, it's spelled correctly, and that the help makes sense. Um, we want to give you a very convenient user experience that you should have all the answers you need at your fingertips if you have a question. Uh, but the objective obviously being you shouldn't have questions because it should just make sense in the first place. So that's what we're aiming to do. Uh, so the large screen allows us to be able to display all that information and everything since it's displayed in full text gives you ideas of what it exactly is that you're doing and then you have the help available if you don't. So if you want to use something on the menu, we always have these options available on the screen. You can also use the enter button if you want to select something. If you're more familiar with that, we give you options. Um, and we did touch on this. Accessories going between accessories and locomotives, one button. That's it. We try to make things very automatic, like the connection process in the beginning uh, and the tutorial that it goes through when you first power on the unit for the very, very first time that you get it. Uh, and it walks you through the process, and it should do that for a lot of different things as well. And give you a good understanding of how to use it so that... Uh, Theoretically, between having the help button at your disposal and having some prompts, there's a very real chance that you might never have to crack, crack open the manual whatsoever, because it'll prompt you whenever you need to do something, 
or if you have a question, you can press help. And it basically takes a little piece of that manual, puts it right in front of your eyes, you can see exactly what you need, and then you can clear that and do what you need to do. Yeah, so here's an example of what happens if the throttle can't find a Wi-Fi. Like, for example, if uh, you go to a new place, like you powered it up at your home and now you're at your club, obviously it won't know what the Wi-Fi there is. But it'll say, hey, wait a minute, I don't recognize any of the Wi-Fi networks that are around. Do you want to try again? Did you, is your router off? Do you want to add a new one? Or why on earth am I seeing this? <laughs> so you can click that, and it'll say, hey, we didn't find any Wi-Fi. Are you in a new place? Maybe you need to add a new one, you know, stuff like that. So uh, things like this, trying to make it automatic, trying to make it real simple for everybody out there. And then, all right, one of the other features of the throttle is yard mode. And this is a new feature that's on our throttle. It's an operational mode for when you're on the drive window. And yard mode is designed for when you're operating the yard switcher. And it makes the control method for it a little bit more simplistic than uh, your traditional method. What it'll do is you have, um, oh, I'll just cover this first. So when you turn on yard mode, it doesn't interfere with any of your other functions other than your speed control. That's it. So any of your momentum settings, any of your CD programming, any of your functions that you have set to it, don't change. It remains completely the same. It only changes the way that the speed <coughs> control works on the throttle. So you have the up and down chevrons. What this will do, the double up chevron will operate the locomotive fast in forward, or fast in reverse, or slow in forward, and slow in reverse. Each one of these is configurable by rotating the thumb wheel if you press the button down. So by default, your slow would be whatever your uh, single fast up speed would be, which is by default is 10. And then your fast would be double that, so it'd be 20. So if I push this button and hold it down, it would move at 20 speed steps in forward. If I push this, it would be 20 speed steps in reverse, 10 in reverse, and 10 in forward. If you want to operate for a long distance, you just double tap any of the buttons, and it will lock that speed in, and it'll just cruise along at whatever speed it was. You'll also get the indication on the screen here of which direction you're going and what speed you're going at. And like I said, if you adjust the thumb wheel, it will um, change the speed for either the fast or the slow speed. Now when you let go of the button, does it let the engine come to a stop then? If it is not latched in, if you, put, if you release the button, it sets the speed to zero. So it would either stop or it would follow your momentum, whatever that is. So what I like to do is I'll set up my, my switcher with some momentum in it. That way, when it hits zero, it's still going to coast to a stop, and if I need to, I can hit the brakes. So I don't have to be messing with the throttle a whole bunch. Uh, we were at the shop, and I was working around with three different switchers at the same time using this, and it made it really easy. Yeah, the general idea up. here is you hold down the button, and it goes until you let go of the button. The yeah. one button press to operate your locomotive. And you don't have to push the direction key. You just change which button you're pushing, and it changes the direction that you're so making yard moves and shuffling cars around gets a little bit more convenient. Will that mess up your engine? Nope. Big pass forward and best shot reverse. Nope. It does nothing to the speed other than what you're controlling it. So any sort of programming or anything like that doesn't change that. Okay. So if you have your momentum set to zero, you could slam it back and forth, theoretically. But you'll have to move between the buttons first. So if it's set to zero and you let go of the button, it stops and then you push the other button, then it starts going the other way. So you're not gonna get a whole lot of slamming, if any, and if you have a little bit of momentum, that probably is going to. It has to come to a stop before it can change directions, if it has momentum. So, uh, we talked about uh, throttle consisting. We call our system in throttle consisting because the, the consist that you set up is 100% within your throttle and that's it. It's completely independent of the command station that you're connected to and anybody else that's operating. Uh, in throttle consisting makes it a lot easier to make and break consist, add on helpers and remove helpers, and if you want to change that unit back to single unit operation instead of having it in that consist, and it allows you to be able to manage individual locomotives rather than the consist as a whole, as you would find with like a NCE built consist or something like that. So the question is, does that modify the consist setting on the engine? or just use two separate 
This will use two different IDs, three different IDs, four different IDs, however many you have in your consist. It doesn't edit CV values. It doesn't override any consist settings that you've had. Uh, you can actually use CV19 consists and command station based consists with our throttle. Um, it, it just completely transparently. That's the word. Yeah. You have the ability to send functions to the consist like you would on an NCE, or I believe other systems also have that as well. In the consisting menu, you also have the options not shown here. We also have the option to edit the function map for a particular locomotive, whichever one it is you have set up. So I could say that uh, I only want to have the center unit respond to eight, which is the mute button or something like that, and nothing else. But the, the, the big advantage to this consisting system is that for people who are constantly making and breaking consist, people who run two lead units and then a helper that only helps on hills and then it disappears again or stuff like that, those sort of operations get a lot easier because you can just add and remove locomotives without having to do any programming or anything crazy like that or two different speed controllers. So two in different theory problems. you could take uh, command station based contest, contest address <coughs> and add a locomotive to the transparent using this. Yes, that's add exactly right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Without messing up the normal <coughs> consist of the other one. Correct. Correct. Yes. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> And let's say I have two U23Bs and I'm shuffling stuff around and then I want to put them together and then take them apart later or something like that. I could do that really quick with our consisting system as well. Question about that. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm in some part of the railroad where I have two engines that I want to run intermittently back and forth between the two of them. Mm -hmm. What would be the best way with this throttle to switch back and forth between those two engines? <coughs> so that brings us to the next section of this, which I don't know. Is okay. it on the next menu? It is. Yeah, it is. Okay. So if you're on the drive window and you push the enter button, which is the one that looks like a carriage return, you get this menu. It shows you all the members of your consoles. And whichever one's highlighted and has a little asterisk here is the one that is your lead engine. If you then pick one of the other ones from the list and select it, that locomotive becomes your lead engine. And depending upon how you set it up when you built the consist, you can change the direction of whatever it is that it is. Uh, you're gonna change cab. Your little engineer on your layout's gonna get out of that one and it's gonna get into that one. So everything becomes perspective-based and locomotive-based at that point. So if I then go and let's say this one is forward and this one's actually reverse instead of forward. <coughs> if I go and I get in this cab, if I set the throttle to forward, it'll be based on the perspective of that engine. So it would be reverse, but I'm going forward because the cab is facing forward. So that's the way I'm gonna go in forward. Um, so it'll send the functions to that selected engine as well. Mm -hmm. So whatever uh, bell, horn, whatever, that'll only go to my lead engine and it won't go to any of my helpers or trailing engines. And you'll see them displayed in the window there, separated with little plus signs. So if you stack locomotives on those, you're just going to continue to go off the side of your screen. You can tack 20 of them up, you're going to see the first three or four. But that's how they're shown. You have your number, and a plus sign, another number, keep track of them like that. Yeah. And then if you're wondering, well, I don't remember what they all are, you can just push the button here, and you'll come into this member screen, and you can select which one you want. And you can have as many helpers as you want, obviously. Uh, and then, like you mentioned there, you can also control CB19 command consist at the same time. And you can consist, you can consist consists. Oh, yeah. Sounds like a great idea, right? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions about this? Okay, well, I just want to follow up on yeah. that. So, I'm in a yard, okay, and there's a switcher there, and I'm bought in a train. I need to go back and forth. I need to use the switcher for a while. I need to use the, the, the engine that came in with the train. Because I'm making various moves at a railroad, how many keystrokes to s go back and forth between those two? One. Just if, one? If you use the quick recall function, let's say you have a consist of locomotives and you have a single locomotive. Yes. If I select my single locomotive after I've already used my consist, the consist goes into my quick recall. Okay. If I push the recall button, it swaps between the consist and my single engine. So I just one, I go back and forth and then can just operate the throttle normally as I, after hitting that single key. Yes. Okay, excellent. Yep. 
So, <laughs> what does the future hold for TCS? What are we working on? Well, obviously, uh, we have our throttle. That means we need a command station, too, so we're working on that. Uh, we mentioned that at the beginning here with uh, you here, talking about uh, the team coming here. We're going to be working for uh, a week, a couple weeks here on developing our command station and get a good sense for what we need to do to get it out on the market as well. Uh, the throttle should be shipping later this month or the beginning of next month. It's already the end of this month. Uh, so the beginning of next month and then the command station comes out after that. <coughs> we're also working on a uh, tool that you could load onto your computer that we're calling a Depot. Uh, Depot is going to be able to update a bunch of, uh, uh, update your firmware on your throttles as well as cover a bunch of other things. Uh, Non-throttle and non-command station related things we're working on downloadable sounds and scale sound all this sort of stuff is on the horizon as we continue to improve our technologies and methods. Fine, you cover depot if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So the TCS Depot, which stands for the Desktop Engineering Programming and Operations Tool, does all of those things. Um, it's in early development right now, but we actually have a release version that you could go to the website today, download, and use for yourself. This is going to be a key thing for anyone who purchases a throttle. Because, as Dan mentioned, this is one of the most important things about this throttle. It is upgradable at home. So there's no point when you should ever have to send this throttle back to us to do a software upgrade or a feature upgrade. We're going to be releasing those you know, whenever we come up with things like that, and we'll send them out. If you have the software at home on your computer, it's as simple as downloading that. If a patch or a firmware update will automatically load into there, all you need to do is connect the throttle to your computer using Wi-Fi. You'll notice there's no cords on these. It's a Wi-Fi connection. And then press the update button. It's that simple. Now, if we come out with feature updates, like let's say we have something additional that's really cool. It's Yard Mode 2.0. It does way more things like that. You're going to get that update because you bought a throttle. We'll push that out to you, and now you can download it and have this new thing to play with inside the throttle that you already own. Or if it's just a simple bug fix or a patch or an upgrade of all the software, you'll get that as well. Right Isn't the JMRI a still update? You yeah, can you can JMRI. do it through JMRI. Okay, so that's something I always forget to mention. You can also do firmware updates through JMRI, through Panel Pro. And obviously JMRI and Panel Pro run on every computer that's out there right now, like including Mac. And obviously we're taking advice and ideas on how to expand that tool in the future as well. Mm -hmm. There you go. There's some screenshots from the depot. This right here is quick indication for sections, update devices. There's the throttle. There's the coders, configurations, and then operations will also exist as we expand this tool out. And then right here is a screen um, showing you how a typical throttle update would work. First, you would power off your command station and throttles. Turn on the throttle that you're going to update. Press 7 on the startup screen to open that into a bootloader mode and then to make sure your network is connected. And it's as simple as loading the patch that we send you right there, connecting to your throttle, and you click right, and then a little status bar goes across, and within two, three, four minutes of opening this program, your throttle is updated. Does that go over the wide throttle protocol your throttle? No, that goes over LCC. Yeah. So if you, upload, if you boot up into bootloader mode, it automatically puts you into LCC mode so we can communicate these uh, update files. So in JMRI, if you were to do this through JMRI through Panel Pro, you'd have to connect an LCC mode. 